So hello everyone, this is the work of one of our students, Anna Wilhelm. So stubborn set is a technique to reduce the number of states that are considered during search. On the other hand, resources naturally appear in many planning problems, uh, but in the context of the stubborn set construction, uh, the consideration of resources introduces a couple of complications. So how to address those will be the topic of this talk. Um, so uh, this is the outline of the, of the talk. First I'm going to introduce some relevant background and show you what we mean by resources exactly. And then I'm going to recap the strong stubborn set definition from planning, show, uh, point out the particular issues that arise from the consideration of resources, and I'll show you our attempts to um, well, address those issues. I will conclude um, the talk with a couple of experiments on IBC benchmarks. So we cons consider FDR planning as a basis. So an FDR task is, is described in terms of a set of finite, sta finite domain state variables, a set of actions, a uh, single initial state, and um, a partially defined goal. So here's, an, uh, here's the running, uh, running example that I'm going to use throughout this talk. The overall goal of this task is to just buy all, packet, uh, or all products. Um, the states are described in terms of two Boolean variables, one for each product, indicating whether it has been bought or not. And there is a buy action for each, uh, for each product, which um, doesn't have any precondition, and sets the, 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 the corresponding variable to true. Obviously, the plans are just given by um, applying both buy actions in any order. Now, a resource FDR task is an extension of an FDR task by a set of uh, non-negative resource variables. We assume here that each resource variable is bounded from above by a finite resource capacity. Now the states are given by the complete um, assignments to the FDR variables as well as the resource variables. And each action additionally specifies an additive, um, so, for, for each, uh, so each action specifies for each resource variable an additive um, resource effect. So in the state that results from the application of an action, the value of a resource is um, obtained by just adding the resource effect to the value of the resource in the current state. But this operation is only legal if um, the resource does not fall, so the resulting value does not fall below zero and does not um, exceed the maximum resource capacity of, of that resource. Um, so we will often distinguish between two types of resource effects. So we say that an action consumes a resource if um, the corresponding resource effect is negative, and an action produces a resource if the corresponding um, resource effect is positive. So back in the example, to make it slightly more interesting, we um, limit the, the maximum number of products that can be carried at any point in time. For that, we introduce a resource variable B with initial state value and, uh, and resource capacity of two, and we change the buy action so that each one um, consumes one unit of this resource. Obviously, the plans are still, still given by just applying both buy actions in any order. Now, state reduction techniques have become fairly popular in optimal planning in the recent years. Here we consider particularly um, pruning functions that, given any state, return a subset of actions. During search, we then branch only over the actions that are given by the set, but we ignore all the rest. Um, in order to still guarantee to find an optimal plan, we require the pruning function to be safe, which means that um, for, any given, for any given state, it should return a set of action that contains the first action of an optimal plan. To compute such, um, such a pruning function, strong stop on set, as I will show you in a moment, make use of the permutability of actions. So the idea is to, to avoid the exploration of multiple permutations of the same action sequence if all those permutations lead to the same state anyway. So formally, two applicable actions are called permutable in a state if they can be applied in any order and both orders lead to the same resulting state. Vice versa, two, two states are uh, interfering in a state if they're not permutable in that state. And the final ingredient that's required are necessary enabling sets. So a necessary enabling set for an action A in a state is given by a set of actions so that every applicable action sequence that contains this action A also contains another action from the set uh, before the first occurrence of A. So now uh, stub uh, strong stubborn sets um, pose three requirements on a set of actions. Um, I should say that those um, conditions are mainly of theoretical interest. I will show you in a couple of slides how they can be computed in practice. So condition one requires that um, this, the strong stubborn set contains an action of some optimal plan. 
The second um, condition requires for every applicable ac for every action in the set that is not applicable in the state that the stubborn set contains a uh, necessary enabling set for that for that action. And the third um, requirement is that every action that is in the set which is applicable in the state the stubborn set should contain all actions that interfere with this action any state that is visited along some optimal plan. So we'll now briefly go over the main proof arguments. Um, they will become later uh, important later on. So uh, the first condition um, basically implies directly that there is an optimal plan which, which shares an action with the strong stubborn set, right? So uh, let's consider the first action in this plan, which is also contained in the stubborn set. If this action was not applicable in the, in the state, then um, condition two would imply that there is another action um, from, the st from, the, uh, from the strong stubborn set that appears before AK. But since we assume that, uh, that K is minimal, this such an action cannot um, exist, and therefore we know that AK must be applicable in the state. Uh, similarly, uh, we get um, through this minimality assumption and by condition three that a k cannot interfere with any of its preceding actions in any of its preceding states. But this means that we can actually just move a k to the front. So um, we now have an optimal plan, um, which is, uh, so which is started with an action that appears in these in the strong stubborn set. So we know that the strong stubborn set indeed gives a safe pruning function. So in the so back in the example without a resource variable. Um, consider the set of action which just contains the by p1 action. Since this action must be executed along every optimal plan, we know that condition 1 is satisfied. Um, since this action is already applicable initially, we know that condition 2 is satisfied. And since by p1 and by p2 uh, are permutable in every state uh, in, this, in the example without resources, um, we also know that the third condition is satisfied. So therefore, this, this set indeed gives a strong stubborn set, and when we use it as a pruning function, we will indeed only expand a single path here. But if we now consider the same set of actions in the resource-constrained version, then, well, condition one and condition two are still satisfied because of the same reasons as before. But regarding condition three, consider the state that results from applying um, by P1. In this state, um, um, both by actions actually interfere because they both uh, set the number of available backs to zero and therefore after applying one, the other one can no longer be applied, right? But this means that in the resource constrained version, the only set that actually satisfies the strong stubborn set definition is the one that contains both by P1 and by P2. So we do not get any pruning here at all. But the exact reason for this is actually only because of the over-restrictive um, requirement in condition three. So here we consider all, um, always all states in, in as opt. But if we go back to the uh, proof, we actually make use of condition three only to show that uh, the action AK is, um, does not interfere with any of its preceding actions, any of its preceding states. So we could actually, um, so we can weaken condition three by taking only into account those states that, are actu that actually proceed the considered actions. So if we go then back to our example, then we see that the state T does not proceed by P1 in any optimal plan. So uh, it just doesn't matter whether by P1, by P2 interfere in that state. And notice this set will also be a, a strong stubborn set according to our modified version of, of the definition. But now at, at this point, um, you might wonder what effect this uh, definition and in, pa in particular the um, change in condition three has in practice, right? It's clearly unfeasible, infeasible to um, compute and satisfy all those conditions exactly. So we need to over approximate them. So um, let's, uh, let's um, assume for a moment that we only have consumable resources. One simple but uh, common uh, method to approximate those conditions is by going down to the syntactic level. For the, FDR, for the FDR part of those conditions, we can just use the same uh, approximation methods as before. Um, but now under the consideration of resource variables, in condition two, an action might all actually be not applicable because one of the resource constraints is violated. Um, but since we assume consumable only resources, we know that, so we know that um, the current state does not provide enough of some resource since, the, since one of the resource constraints is, is um, violated. But we also know that we cannot actually increase the level of any resource anymore. So we cannot reach any state where this action can actually be applied, which means that um, in this case, the, the empty set already satisfies the necessary enabling set definition. So in other words, we can just ignore basically consumable only resources in condition two. Regarding condition three, um, two actions might now also interfere uh, because of their resource effects. 
but again, since the um, resource value, uh, the resource values keep decreasing along any action sequence. Um, so as long as we only consider interference at the prefix of a plan, we know that two actions can actually not interfere uh, at, at any point in, the, in, the, in this prefix because of their, just because of their uh, resource effect. So uh, overall, we can just ignore the consumable only resource completely in the, in the computation of a strong star one set. Um, um, but now let, let's consider that um, we have actually some action that um, produces some resource. So let's assume that we limit the, the, the maximum number of bags uh, to one, but we introduce an action get back, which increases the number of available bags by one. Then um, after applying any buy action in the initial state, we must first um, apply this get back action in order to get another bag, right? In order to apply the second buy action. But this means that in particular, both buy actions now interfere in the initial state. So even according, so basically after applying by, for, for example, after applying one by action, the other one is no longer applicable, right? Before we can apply the other by action, we first need to apply the get back action. Um, but this means that even in our modified strong star one set um, definition, um, the, uh, as soon as we consider one of those by actions, we also must consider the other one. So in order to, um, uh, in order to, still, to, to be able to still exploit the permutability of such consume-consume action pairs under the, under the presence of resource production, we need to make another change to the definition. We do so by splitting condition three into two cases. So first we consider interference only at FDR level. So we, so we just ignore the case that two resources can interfere because of their, um, because of their resource effects. And then in order to take into account resource effects, we just make use of a simple trick, namely if two actions that consume the same resource interfere in some state because that state doesn't provide enough of that resource, then clearly bef before we, we, we are able to apply the second action, we must first um, uh, increase the level of the resource again, right? So um, if our set makes sure that it maintains all possible ways the resource can be produced, then, well, we are safe, right? So we ensure this by just um, considering all actions that produce that resource. And similarly, we, um, or we, we uh, handle interference at or because of uh, resource production by just considering all actions that consume that resource. Um, so uh, to evaluate those changes, we have run some experiments in optimal planning, satisfying planning, and for proving unsolvability. And we used um, the benchmarks from the various classical planning competitions, as well as some uh, dedicated resource constraint um, benchmarks. The, um, so to, to use the, the um, resource star one set, we are required to know the resource variables beforehand, right? In order to obtain this information, um, we, we designed a method that automatically um, finds resource uh, variables given just the FDR description of the task. So we always run this resource detection algorithm up front of the resource um, star one set configuration and then just annotate the FDR variables and actions according to the output of this algorithm. Then in each of the three uh, categories, optimal satisfying and unsolvability, we, be, we basically compared three different configurations. So baseline configuration without any additional pruning, a baseline configuration with uh, the standard syntactic strong sub -on set, and a baseline configuration with uh, the resource sub -on set. So in optimal planning, we considered uh, as, as baseline A star with, with the LM cup heuristic and satisfying planning greedy best first search uh, with HFF and preferred operators and for proving unsolv unsolvability we used A star and de uh, delete relaxation to detect that ends. So let's have a look at optimal planning. Um, so this table gives a per domain summary of the results including coverage, aver average search reduction factors and uh, time reduction factors of the sub set variants relative to the baselines or to the baseline. Um, the B column gives the results for um, the baseline, the S column for the standard stub on set configuration, and the R column for the resource variant. As we can see, there are only a few cases where uh, the consideration of resources actually makes a change according to uh, coverage. Uh, the impact is most prominent in resource constraint TBP, where neither the baseline nor the standard strong star one that conf configuration can solve even a single instance, while the resource, while the resource um, star one set configuration solves almost, almost all instances. But um, 
Yeah, there are, there are also several cases where um, search reduction could be, Im could be improved significantly using this um, resource variant of the stubborn set. And there are also cases where the overhead of the stubborn set construction could actually be um, uh, reduced by just taking into account the resource variables. So now in, in satisfying, things change a bit, but not too much. So here there are actually a few cases where the, cover, where the, where the coverage decreased. For example, in elevators, uh, the resource version um, basically lost the search reduction that the standard strong stubborn set variant had to offer. And um, yeah, so overall, um, the, the resource um, stubborn set configura configuration still performs slightly better than the strong stubborn the standard strong stubborn set configuration and um, as an optimal planning search, redu search reduction could be improved significantly in open stacks and pathways and in the resource constraint um, benchmarks our resource stubborn set seems to be really able to make use of, of the resource variable so in all those domains the coverage was increased. So let's con conclude the talk. So we have seen methods to um, extend the uh, stop on set definition in optimal planning in order to take into account resource variables and to exploit their commutative behavior. Um, uh, even though that um, this, uh, the, the modified stop on set construction method only improved slightly over the, the previous method, uh, there, are, there were only very few domains where um, performance was actually negatively um, influenced. On the other hand, there were several domains where coverage could be, uh, or, or as, uh, um, at least search reduction could be um, improved significantly. So for future work, we would like to experiment also with continuous resource variables. And the explicit consideration of resource variables in the stubborn set definition also su suggests to take a look at other um, state reduction techniques. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Time for questions. No? Okay. Um, I'll ask one. Um, so, how does this relate to other settings like oversubscription planning? Uh, how does this relate to oversubscription planning? Um, I guess you can also apply this to oversubscription planning, but you just have to modify the strong stop on set definition. So because you, you in oversubscription planning, you don't have a specific goal, right? Mm -hmm. So you might have to um, change the first condition basically of the strong stop on set uh, condition, but other than that, it should be, should be working out of the box basically. Yeah, that's my imagination. Other questions? I'll ask another one then. So about satisfying planning. Mm -hmm. So uh, doesn't seem uh, to help much. Well, I mean, at least in the resource constraint benchmark, it works or it helped a bit in terms of right, right. coverage so, and then. So, so my comment was that it doesn't help. Uh, seem to help much in classical planning, but here. It you do have and satisfying planning. Yeah, yeah. So, so there. Are, I mean, there are several cases where it works, but of course there are also cases where it just adds uh, an additional overhead, and yeah, basically it's not. So it's really domain dependent whether it works or not. Any more questions? Let's thank the speaker again. Okay.